and then it provides consistency on how you assess student to student and it eliminates the bias and when you're grading. Um, I know for me, sometimes if there's a project to be done, some people go um, upward and outbound on certain things with materials. And then there's some people that just do it very simple and, and, and I guess, yes, very simple. And so I wanna make sure that I'm grading appropriately to what the rubric is asking. So it does provide that consistency for me. It will also expedite the grading process. Some of these types of rubrics, there is work ahead of time to construct them. Um, and that's why I'm going over the three different types um, to fit your needs. And then also for you to, it's for you to determine which one would suffice for the assessment or assignment that you're going to be issuing. Um, rubrics don't always need to be used on every single thing, um, but for major, assessments, um, sometimes it is very helpful for the student to understand what they're going to be assessed on. Um, but it can definitely, once you've done that work up front to create the rubric, um, it's easily, you can easily manipulate um, the descriptors on the rubric um, when things change from assessment to assessment. So again, these are the three types we're going over, holistic, analytic, and single point. So the first one is holistic. So a holistic, um, a holistic rubric reflects the level of performance by assessing performance across multiple criteria as a whole. So it's kind of a package deal in the description. This is the package that you need to suffice in order to get an A paper. This is the description package for a B paper and then so on and so on. Um, looking at this holistic rubric, can anybody tell me what this type of rubric um, disadvantage might be? I know um, I was in a recent conference and some people like, do holistic rubrics still exist? Um, or maybe you could just share in the chat menu if you've used a holistic rubric. Anybody? Anybody? Defining what some of the words may mean is subjective. Yes, thank you. Leads into a lot more, needs more interpretation for sure. Yeah, so although the holistic rubric takes less time to create, um, it can be difficult for the students to understand the descriptions. It might be a little too wordy. It might, they might not understand that they have met all of them. It doesn't give them a clearly defined um, idea on how they performed. It's just you're in this range, um, but not telling them specifically what they did well. If some of the qualities are exhibited in an A paper, but not all of the qualities. Exactly. Very good. Thank you. So this is an example of a holistic rubric in Canvas. Um, as you can see, uh, original rubrics like on a on on a pdf or whichever are usually horizontally but in the canvas it'll be more of a column section but it still lines up with your criteria listed here and then it'll go into the ratings of exceeds or met or not met just to kind of give you an idea of what the how the format changes from your own copy of your own rubric um, a pdf or um, implementing it into canvas the next type of rubric is an analytic rubric. It's a little bit big, so you'll have to, I tried to fit it in so you could, it could be readable, but this is a, a writing assessment scoring guide from uh, Pennsylvania State. Um, the criteria is listed here. The, the analytic rubrics, they articulate levels of performance for each criteria. So instead of it being a package deal now we're unpacking it and we're setting each criteria individualized and then we're we are um i guess transferring that across performance um, levels of four three two and one so in a, an analytic rubric it's really important to use language that shows the proficiency level so let's just for an idea let's look at criteria focus um, it starts off with sharp and distinct, and then it goes to apparent. 
um, instead of a sharp and distinct controlling point, an apparent point was made. And then a level two, there's no apparent point made. And then a level one, minimal evidence of a topic. Language is very important in an analytic rubric. Analytic rubrics take a little bit more time, um, but they provide useful feedback for the student to know for each criteria how well they did and maybe how um, what they need to work on. So again, you um, oh sorry, you have the criteria listed, but it's unpackaging the criteria in individual sections, and then it is mapped across different levels of performance. Can anybody tell me if they've used an analytic rubric? Yes or no? You can I'm also kind of use a reaction emoji. I... Or yeah, thumbs up, <laughs> whichever. This one definitely takes a little bit more work up front um, because you have these descriptors, you're looking at the wording, um, and you're separating the criteria into, into parts but it can be very, very helpful for students to know what specifically they do well instead of a package deal like a holistic rubric. So there are some pros and cons to each type of rubric. It's really gonna depend on your assignment and your assessment that you're um, pushing out um, and how these rubrics are going to be able to fit um, for, the student, for student success. So this is an example of what an analytic rubric looks like in Canvas. It is very similar. You've got the criteria listed here on the left-hand side. Um, it is individualized, and then it is brought over a set of performance ratings, exceeds, met, or not met, and then you have your points at the end. Okay. And then we come to our third rubric type, which is the single point rubric. This is the, um, and this is based off of the critical thinking um, pack learning outcome um, criteria. So I kind of used that, Amanda, thank you. Um, but this type of rubric is very succinct in that it is like an analytic rubric. It clarifies the expectations. Usually it's within the middle um, criteria column, and then you either put met or not met. Um, it, focuses on, um, it, it focuses exclusively on the level of proficiency expected for the students um, to obtain, but it doesn't tell them the range. And this might seem like it's gonna be easy to create and, and utilize in your classroom. Um, and sometimes it is for those low stakes assignments, um, but the feedback portion, this, is, this also gives you independence on and freedom to provide more feedback. So if they didn't meet it, um, then you would add your feedback into that column. Or if they um, if they had met it, then you could either leave it with a check mark and they understand that they've met that criteria. But it doesn't leave a lot of room for that type of conversation. Um, I mean, you could, but it'll take a little bit of time. So this is an idea on what a single point rubric looks like in Canvas. And again, you have your criteria, and then you have your met or not met at the ratings at the end. Can anybody tell me really quick why, um, if you've used a, a single point rubric before? I think I've seen this on some courses. And just because we're a small group, I'm just curious, like what, Yes. I mean, this looks like something that I would use like in a discussion or something, yeah. you know, where you have yes, an is. answer with specific content and then you responded to two other people or something like that. Good. Thank you, Russ. And I, I don't think I know where everybody, what departments, so these rubrics, they could be useful. I'm, I'm not sure. Let's see. Ah, the beginning of a course for orientation. Absolutely. Um, just because it's a low stakes, it's like real quick, um, the criteria is listed, they don't need that much feedback um, on a single point rubric at times, but you could. Good job, thank you. Okay, 
So I'm going to give you some topics or I'm going to give you some assignment, um, I guess, assi types of assignments. And I want you to tell me in the chat menu or out loud which type of rubric you think it would fit. And there's no right or wrong answer here. I just want to see how maybe somebody has used a type of rubric to fit. Um, and maybe this isn't within your wheelhouse and I get it, but um, I tried to make it... Um, more generalized let's see so a discussion board a lot of um, departments use discussion board um, if you could tell me or put in the rubric um, what type of rubric would you use for a discussion board would it be single point would it be an analytic or would it be a holistic and i think russ you kind of already voiced your opinion on discussion board maybe being a single point yeah, that's kind of the way I would approach a discussion board because it's it's typically pretty straightforward and yeah, yeah especially Thank if you, it's Lillian. something like, like that. Yeah, single point would be quick to review. That's a great point. Um, holistic would also work. I was thinking about that too when we were going through this uh, earlier. Me and Jill I was like, you know maybe next time I'll do a holistic rubric, you know, because you could either say like, okay, this was a a response, you did these things, um, but one point could also work. Those are both Definitely, really yeah, holistic and single point look, I guess the single point's more of a compressed type of analytic, but because it has the listed criteria um, individualized, but it is very quick, yes. Thank you, Lillian. Written responses, and I guess the question here is how long of a written response? So we're just going to say, um, I don't know, uh, an essay. So maybe I should have put an essay response. Uh, what type of rubric would you use on a on an essay um, assignment? Would it be holistic, analytic? I'd use the analytic. I agree. <laughs> analytic. Why do you think analytic? Amanda or Russ, just curious. <laughs> uh, for like an essay, if you were, if well, it depends on, uh, well, typically you would be looking for uh, content, structure, all those different elements. Um, Very good, yes. Th thank you, Russ. Yeah, definitely with something that's longer, you wanna give them an idea on what specifically they did well. So, um, you know, whether it's conventions or organization or style, um, if you give them a holistic grade, which you could, it gives them a range, but it doesn't specifically say, you know, hey, you did great on organization or you did great on style, which K through 12 students, they really struggle with style and voice. A lot uh, so giving them something that's a little bit more detailed on what they need to work on is helpful research projects so would we use a holistic rubric uh, a single point or um, an analytic rubric it's okay if the responses are the same I just I'm curious yeah. and there are no wrong or right answers we're just thinking through <laughs> yeah this know? one's kind of tough because I get, if the topic's so open-ended, it's almost like I would want to try a holistic rubric just because, I don't know, if they're not all doing the same research, if they're doing different research, it would just give them more gui give them some guidelines for what they can do, but not limit what they can do Makes or sense. limit how they, how they do the project. But at the same time, if it's a little bit more structured, I think analytic would probably be my choice. There you go, yeah. Analytic for sure, um, but I can see how the holistic could fit as well because you don't want to limit them. So I guess the criteria on a analytic would have to make sure to not be too specific on what they're presenting on, but maybe how they're presenting it and then organization, things like that will definitely fit into a research project on an analytic um, rubric. Okay, thank y'all. Sorry, I know it's maybe before noon. <laughs> okay, so when we're thinking about rubric construction, I just think about, a f I just want you to think about a few things, like what learning does the task measure? So remember that rubrics can help you 
kind of focus and figure out like what specifically am I trying to get them to do? What's that performance task going to measure? Um, because some people come with this elaborate like type of writing and or whether it's a project and it's elaborate and it's got all the fluff, but my rubric keeps me focused. Um, also keep in mind, are you going to teach everything that you'll measure? Like maybe push, push something out at the beginning of a course and see who takes a bite. Um, it's not, I know students, in my experience, they will only do it if it's graded, but that's not how you learn. So understand that a rubric doesn't always have to, is, you don't need a rubric for everything. Um, next, what will the quality work look like on the task? Like providing your students with an example from previous courses. Now, I know that we want to make sure that everybody upholds integrity and not try to plagiarize and like everything is uniform to that example but it does give people some sort of inspiration like oh that's okay that's how you wanted us to kind of do it but providing that quality work um, will suit what your expectations are on the rubric um, and then the last one how much of the grade depends on outside resources so making sure to take in consideration if someone has a presentation that may be on a poster board versus a PowerPoint. Um, making sure that you know where your students are at the very beginning of your course, as you all know, is really important to see like, what's their, wh where are they from? What's going on? Like I've told most of the people I've been introducing myself to, I'm a San Antonio native. I'm, you know, from um, Northside Independent School District, Northeast. And so those are familiar if you're from San Antonio. Um, and so making sure that you understand your students ahead of time will also provide you that scope on how much how much the grade really depends on the resources that your students have. Yeah, I think Jill was t talking to me about this earlier and she had a really great example how maybe they're doing a project and if you have creativity being one of your criteria, right? Making sure that we're not just assessing that on, you know, how much money can the student throw at a project, right? Because <laughs> um, some students might have a lot of time and, and resources to, to build some really elaborate thing, or maybe they have some software that other students don't have. Um, so thinking about that, I think, is, a, is valuable and kind of when you're thinking through the creating a rubric, like, am I making sure that I'm doing this, uh, that all of these criteria are accessible to all my students, right? that success doesn't just look like, you know, the, I, for some reason in my head, I keep thinking of this, the um, science fair, you know, where you always had those kids oh, yeah. who like their parents totally did the project. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so that we're, we're being equitable in how we're assessing it. We're really focusing in on um, the learning, right. And not necessarily giving a whole bunch of extra bonus points for, uh, you know, mommy did the, science fair project. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Thank thanks, you, Amanda. Thanks, Lily. Thank you, Erin. Um, one <laughs> other thing that I'd like to kind of, can y'all see my screen? Because I know yeah. I'm in a different mode. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes and I want y'all to take a look at this rubric. Um, there are 38 students that this rubric was given to. Um, it's very, it's very similar to the rubric I just showed you. Um, but on this rubric, there are some bolded numbers of how many students obtained that performance criteria. So I want you to take a look at all that, look at the numbers. The numbers are specific to um, how many students obtained that criteria um, level. So um, we'll reconvene. If you could tell me, the question is, what do you see um, that the students might have done right? And what do you see that the students might have need more help with. So I'll give you a few seconds to kind of figure that out and make sure you're utilizing the numbers that are bolded because those are how many students obtained that performance level. If you want to put your response in the chat menu, what did these students do right? What could they work on? Yeah, I think uh, Russ beat me to it. They definitely have some trouble with focus, right? <laughs>
Okay. And Russ, can you just share with us quickly, like your um, rationale for focus? Well, just from a numbers standpoint across the board, uh, it looks like there's a there's a large group there, right? Eleven that at no apparent point. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I would think that that would be important. Yeah. Overall. Thank you. Yeah. So definitely this is called. Um, so after you're done issuing a, out a rubric, I know myself, I'm like, Woof, that took a long time to craft this rubric and give it out to students and explain it and all that. But at the end of it all, did they understand what I communicated to them at the beginning with this rubric? Did they understand the criteria that we learned in class? Um, so even though I've done all my part at the at the forefront, I want to make sure at the end that we still type kind of look at the rubric to see, you know, I had a lot of students who need help with focus. I have a lot of students that are in organization style that um, some of those numbers are a little bit bigger. Um, but I'm always looking to see where I can maybe have those reteach moments. Maybe I can just celebrate certain things. I'm like, y'all know what? Y'all did a really good job on organization. Maybe I don't have to spend so much time on that. Um, or maybe we were just in the middle. Students love competition. They want to know what level they're at, just like a video game. It's like, you know what? I'm on level one still. I can't seem, to... and they understand that concept of trying to get out of that level one. But if if you don't do the mapping of your rubric results, then you won't know and it'll be just kind of like packed away and then we move on to the next thing. Um, I know for myself, it does take a little bit of time to kind of do this, um, but I always need to figure out like, is there something that I miss because I don't want to keep going and they're just drowning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lillian, yes. There's a difference between the three and four, and so I would wonder how I can get the threes to the fours as well as it's very good, yes, absolutely. I'm curious, you know, if you had, if you did this rubric in a class in Canvas, what, what, how would you how would you track it? Well, I mean, it, it seems like yeah. individually counting would sort of require quite a bit of yeah. time. So I so when we go through the process of grading, I know um, I would usually probably print it up. I'm a paper person, um, but if I even if I'm just grading online pretty quickly, if I'm seeing that I'm getting a lot of, I mean, some people can naturally just see, you know, I'm getting a lot of fours in organization or um, just writing that little uh, piece somewhere on a sticky. I'm a sticky note queen over here, but um, just writing that down, even if if it's not this detailed you can bring something back to the classroom to share with the, um, whether it's a reteach moment or a celebration of some sort and say, you know what, we are awesome at this. Like y'all got this down packed. Um, and then maybe introducing something um, along the lines of, you know what, just by your perception, you know what, I saw that, you know, I'm giving a lot of twos in this. And so you'll pick up on that if you're grading online. For me, I print this out and then I start doing it in a more, so it does take a little bit more time. Um, but there is an, there's the other way where you can just kind of write that down real quickly. I always have like four or five criteria that I, actually two or three criteria that I write down that I know, you know what, I saw this happening a lot where I was giving a lot of twos on this and we start talking about it. Yeah, um, to that point, Russ, it's like you read my mind. I went searching. I was like, can Canvas do this for us? Um, so far, I haven't been able to find anything where Canvas will do that for us. But it is something that I'm going to actually put in the request. I love that with the Canvas community that you can ask them to do things. If they get enough requests, they a lot of times will roll out some kind of update. So hopefully that might be something we can do in the future because it is a great analytic. Um, one kind of like cheat that I would have is to have um, like basically print off this chart what you see right here and then just do like little hash marks for every time as I kind of go through it. It's a simple cheat, but that would be probably my way of of, uh, of keeping track a little bit myself. But I think Jill has a good point where you start to notice those patterns, you know, as you're kind of going through it. And then if you really see it, you might be like, yeah, I might take a look at focus and see how they did across the board on focus because it looks like they were a little weak. But overall, I really love 
this idea of taking our rubric results and doing a little bit of an analysis on them because um, if you look at the overall grades, that doesn't give you the same picture, right? So you might be like, man, my students were like B and Cs, but it doesn't really tell you like what they struggled with from a design perspective of like, what, what do I need to make sure that I'm teaching differently or that I need to reteach as uh, Jill had mentioned. So, um, you know, even if this is like the final project of a semester, maybe that can give you some insight into how to design the project differently the next semester. If I noticed that every single student had a trouble with citations, <laughs> then maybe I need to teach them citation methods a bit better, things like that. Yep. Thank you, Erin. So now we're going to take a look at rubrics in Canvas. So I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to give it to Erin. Oh, actually, do you, could you reshare the the um, PowerPoint? I think there was two slides that I was going to, no, I don't have those pulled up. Sorry, Jill. <laughs> oh, no worries. Sorry. All right. Yeah. So um, rubrics in Canvas. So let's go ahead and click through this here. All right. So um, you can sorry, click again. <laughs> um, as we said before, rubrics are a way of communicating your expectations to your students. And one of the things that I really love about Canvas is that it's built in their learning management system. They can see it as soon as they access the assignment um, and it's not you know, buried somewhere for them to find. Go ahead and keep clicking. So um, the other really fantastic thing about rubrics in Canvas is that they sync with your grade book. Um, and so it's going to make grading so much uh, more seamless and it gives that kind of feedback to the students too. So. Um, I think it makes it a lot more transparent, the grading process. So some best practices for using rubrics in Canvas is one, really making sure that you're providing detailed descriptions for the different ratings. Um, and I like how Jill was mentioning earlier, making sure that it's like student friendly language. So sometimes, you know, um, we can have all these criteria in our head, but if it doesn't make sense to the student, then it's really not helping them to be successful. It's helping me as the professor to grade. Um, and that's a really of, good, uh, just, okay. that's a really good point, you know, that language is so important, uh, when you're crafting those, yeah, things. No, thanks, thanks, Russ, for slowing me down there, because, yeah, I mean, that is a really important thing, I'm, um, the purpose of a rubric is really that kind of twofold, right, it's for me in grading, but it's also real, and probably the undersold part is that it's for our students to help them be successful. It gives them that kind of roadmap of, this is what I need to do to be successful. Um, and so with that, I find it really important to teach students how to find and use the rubrics in Canvas, um, because some students may have never seen a rubric before, never been told you know, how that can help them be successful in the assignment. Um, and so, I always like to start off the semester if I'm using rubrics to to show the students like, hey, this is where you find them. This is how I'm going to grade you, right? So you want to know how to get an A on this paper? It's all right here. <laughs> I've clearly described every aspect that you need to know to be successful. Um, yeah, so uh, even sharing with students the resources on campus that can help them. That's a really good point. So. Um, whether it's accessibility services, the writing centers, um, you know, really sharing with them what they can do to be successful. All right, so I'm actually going to do some demoing now. I'm going to show you how to build some rubrics in Canvas. Um, before we get started, how many people have maybe, like, maybe give me an emoji if you've built a rubric in Canvas before? Or you can say, all right, Lillian, thanks. Or one of the Lillians. We've got two Lillians out of our <laughs> in this small room. Awesome. Great. So we have some experience um, and we also have some people who will be showing up for the first time. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Oh, OK. <laughs> Lillian has as well. All right. Um, well, since we have such experience in the room on this, I'll give kind of a uh, highlights version of uh, how to make rubrics. So this is an example course that I have. Um, I, I was an anthropology professor, so excuse me, all my examples are always anthropology. <laughs> um, if I wanna create rubrics, there's kind of two ways that I can do it. Um, one is to go through the rubrics, which is 
a somewhat newish addition to Canvas. It used to be kind of buried in outcomes and now they've actually separated it out. So if I click on rubrics, I can actually see all the rubrics that I have for a course. If you're anything like me and you've copied courses from semester to semester, you might open this up and be like, ah, there's 8,000 rubrics in here. Um, don't worry, you could always kind of open them up and delete them if you want. Um, but if you wanna create a new one, you can always add rubric and it will uh, create a new rubric for this course down here. The other way that you can add a rubric is to actually go through the assignments. So I'm gonna go into my modules for this course and I'm going to find, um, maybe I'm gonna create a new assignment. So what kind of assignment should I create guys? Should it be uh, an essay, a discussion? I don't know, what kinds of assignments are, are we working with in our courses right now? Let's do a discussion. A discussion. Oh no, someone says do an oh, essay in the chat. An essay, perfect, all right. <laughs> all right, so then I'm gonna use just the assignment, right? I'm gonna create a new assignment and I'm going to say essay one. All right. So I'm going to open up my assignment. And if it's an assignment, you'll see that there's this little wonderful add rubric button at the bottom. Um, all I have to do is click plus rubric and I'm uh, given this space to create a new rubric. Um, as you see, the important thing, always title it. This is gonna help you out later when you open that rubrics thing and you don't see some rubric 8,000 times <laughs> repeated over. So I'm gonna call this essay one rubric. Um, I have criteria, I have ratings, um, different criteria. There's no hard and set rule on like how many you need to create. It's really gonna depend on your assignment. If this were an essay, I'd probably have someone similar to the example that um, Jill had showed us earlier, um, but if I want to edit it, I'm going to click these little pencils and maybe I'll say, uh, we'll go with focus again, since that was an issue for some of our students. In the long description, I would write, what do I mean by focus, right? So um, I would provide a description of, you know, ability to make a clear or uh, point in the writing, I, this isn't the best example, but um, you get the idea. So that's my criteria. And then I wanna go into ratings, but really this is gonna kind of depend on what kind of rubric we wanna use. So do we wanna create an analytic rubric? Do we wanna create a single point rubric? Or do we wanna create a holistic rubric? So I'm gonna leave that open. Um, I don't know, for an essay, what do we, what do we feel in? Where are we leaning towards? You can put it in the chat or you can put it, sit, you know, come off mute. What kind of rubric do we want to create? Analytic. Perfect. Thanks, Lillian. <laughs> All right. So with an analytic rubric, um, I'm going to need to decide how many different rating levels I want, right? Um, automatically, you'll see that you are, are always given two and the kind of default is five points. This is completely up to you and you're able to change this. So maybe I wanna go with, um, you know, full, instead of full marks, this is going to be excellent. Ooh, I love it when it already populates. And here I would wanna provide a really descriptive, um, or a, a really clear description of what makes, um, what would, a student need to do to get this rating, right? So what is an excellent focus <laughs> in this? And I would provide that description here. Again, making sure that I'm writing it in student-friendly language. So I would want to write as if I was writing to the student and I would wanna make a really clear rating. So um, I'll just leave that for now, but let's create some more. Again, if I wanna create um, additional, so if I want there to be more than two different rating levels, I'm going to click this little plus sign in the middle, and that's going to create a new one. Um, again, I don't have to go with five points. If I wanted this to be a four points, right, I could change that. Maybe this is good, right, etc. And then I would provide a very detailed description of what good means. 
All right, so I have excellent at five points, good at four. I don't think anybody would actually use these, but I'll go with okay <laughs> uh, for three. And again, you can be as detailed or as um, uh, th these ratings, you don't have to go point by point. They can be a range. And so this is actually something that uh, came into uh, Canvas's uh, rubrics a couple of years ago. Before it used to be you only had the option of clicking five or three. Now you could say like, maybe I want to get rid of um, good and just have excellent, okay, and you know, no credit, right? But what if a student's kind of in between okay and excellent? I can say, I want to be able to give them a range. And there, this is going to be, you know, five to three is excellent, three to zero is okay, and zero is uh, no credit, right? So you have some of these different options. Now, that's just one of our criteria. We're probably going to have several um, for an essay. So I would create another one by going to plus criteria. And it gives you an option. And this is actually kind of handy if you're um, using a similar rating system for all of the different criteria. I can simply say duplicate. And it'll give me a duplicate, but I can change the description. So maybe this next one. Um, what would be another category organization? Um, right. So now I have two criteria with the same rating. I would want to come in here and, you know, again, provide descriptions that are unique to that level of the rating, but I can come in and uh, do that here. All right, let me see. What would be the ideal range? This is a question from Lillian. Um, should it be a 10 point range, i.e. difference between A and B? I don't know, what do we think, guys? I think it really depends a bit on um, the kind of assignments, um, you know, how many points uh, an assignment should be worth. So One on, thing, a holistic, oh, yeah. on a holistic rubric, you definitely want to make sure that there is a range. 10 point range is usually a good point of reference mm -hmm. between the an A and a B. But on an analytic, it's going to be a little different because your criteria is broken up. And so each range um, within, like, let's say focus, um, I mean, usually it's within, it, it can, it can, it depends on how many performance ratings you want, whether you want four or you want five. Um, and in that point, you, I mean, I'm not a math major and this was analytic math, like was so crazy for me. Cause I was like, did I add that up correctly? Because my brain always thinks of like a hundred points at the beginning, right? And how am I gonna yeah, bring me this too. up? <laughs> yeah. And so it can get very detailed um, uh, with trying to make sure your math is correct. So. For me, um, on an analytic rubric, I just make sure to keep everything. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm glad someone's with me on that. Um, I just make sure that everything is either my brain goes to twos or there definitely has to be a range within an A and a B. So on an analytic, it's going to be different. So I, I don't know if that's the easiest answer to give you, but you just want to make I sure can... it, your, all your points at the very end add up to the total point score that you want and make sure that it's even. <laughs> right. I would say, um, and I'll show you some example rubrics here in just a second that I think can maybe help a little bit with uh, deciding what your range is going to be. Part of it depends a little bit on how you set up your course um, if and how you want the grades displayed. So if you want the grades displayed as A's, B's, C's, then probably using like a 100 point scale is going to be uh, familiar to a student. However, if you're having everything maybe this assignment is worth 15% of the grade and you use a 15 point scale, right? So that way they have a clear understanding of, 
you know, how that affects their grade. There's different kinds of advantages and disadvantages. So it kind of a little bit depends on how you set up your course, but I'm definitely a fan of keeping the math simple wherever possible. <laughs> Amanda's, um, Amanda's here to, you know, we have a math major. In, in house, so. Hey, I still keep it simple because you got to make it to where students can understand where their numbers are coming from too. <laughs> exactly. So speaking of keeping the math simple, this is, one of my favorite things about using Canvas rubrics is that you can use them for grading. So let's pretend that this was all that I had for this particular essay assignment and it's worth 10 points. So I'm going to say I want to use this rubric for assignment grading. And when I create that, it's going to then link into the speed grader. And so I'll show that to you in just a minute. Um, that said, I want to show you a little bit of what these other options are. So um, if you want to use this rubric, um, and maybe it's for an ungraded assignment, something that you want to give them feedback, but it's not necessarily graded, you could say remove points from rubric, in which case they would only see kind of what their ratings were, but they wouldn't be associated with points. Now, if I want to write freeform comments when assessing students, um, what that does is it gets rid of the ratings altogether. And instead it gives you a space where you can type in a comment. Some people like this, but I will say that the disadvantage to doing this option is that the student doesn't get to see those ratings up front. They only know the criteria, right? They don't know what they need to do to be successful in meeting that criteria. Um, so I'm a big fan of just saying, I'm going to use this assignment for gradings. Now, there is this question about outcomes in a learning mastery gradebook. As far as I know, there are very, very few departments across the Alamo colleges that are using that feature in Canvas. It's a newer feature. If that's not you, just don't worry about it <laughs> for now. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and create this rubric. Um, all right, it says change assignment points to match rubric. I'm gonna go ahead and change that, yes. So that's one important thing is if you're using rubric, making sure that that lines up with how many points the assignment is actually worth. And it will tell you, it will it will prompt you like that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pretend like I'm gonna publish this assignment. And uh, the students, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and make it a um, online submission. In order to get the speed grader, you're gonna have to have some kind of submission. Oh, there we go. I'll just say text entry, there we go. All right, and now you see how the speed grader popped up. Now let's go in and pretend like we were going to be grading this with the speed grader. Oh, it says I don't have any active students, but let's see if it's gonna load for me. Ah. All right, it might, let me try that again. Sorry, there are no active students. Ugh. I thought I would be able to grade this. All right, so, um, usually a test thing comes up. So hold on, let me go into my grades. I have no students in here. I wonder why I don't even have a test student. That is unusual. But um, let me, I'm gonna go ahead and add you Jill as a, as a student here. <laughs> add me. All right, so Jill's gonna be my student. Good time to plug Jill. She is at jgomez827 at alamo.edu. Anybody is uh, wanting to reach out to her. Erin, I'm just curious um, if you've had any luck or messed around in general uh, looking at Canvas Commons and pulling any, um, you know, rubrics just, you know, it might be there. It's kind yeah. of hard to pull. Um, I was looking into this earlier, pulling rubrics from Canvas Commons because they have to be attached to some kind of assignment or something. Mm. Um, but that is something that we could experiment with doing is putting them up there with like kind of like blank assignments that you could then import and then you would have the rubric. Um, but that's a really good point. So I'm going to go back into grades. So I should have our right, Jill. Can you accept the invitation? That's what I'm doing. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And so while we're doing that, I'll show you a few other examples of some rubrics. So 
Um, here's one for a group presentation project that I had students do. And you can see this is how it would appear to a student at the bottom of that assignment. And um, each one of these criteria has, uh, or each one of these ratings has a clear description of what the student needs to do to meet uh, that point level. So um, the nice thing is that you can have, um, you know, this one has four different levels. This one has three. You can have those variations if you want. Um, but the really wonderful thing is that it's going to add up all this for you. So it's going to make grading this a lot easier. So for this particular assignment, they were required to bring in key findings from two sources and one from the textbook. And so I am able to have those as separate grading criteria, making that a very, very simple uh, grade. All right, so that's one do example. Do we need to add, do we need to publish that course? Oh, that might be what it is. All right. Publish. I'm there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so that's there we go. one um, way to do that. I'm gonna go back into my modules and I'm going to go into my essay one that we created. All right, and so if I go to the speed grader, it should work this time. Yay! All right, so Jill doesn't have an assignment yet, but you know, ta tisk tisk, Jill, you've been in the class for a whole like 30 <laughs> seconds and you haven't submitted. But um, if I click view rubric when I'm grading, I have my grading rubric that we just pulled up and it's as simple as clicking in here and it adds, it does that math for you, which is fantastic. Imagine a much more detailed uh, rubric. You could click, kind of click through, kind of see where the student lines up. One thing that I find really helpful is using this kind of, if you kind of hold it, you can make this bigger. So if you have really detailed de descriptions, I will generally read through the assignment first and then I'll drag this over so I can read this clearer and then I would click through and say all right she did a good job on focus you know maybe not the best job on organization eight out of ten points I just click save and you see the grade pops up here so um, some people uh, may resist rubrics like oh I really like to provide students with lots of feedback I want you to know that you can use a grading rubric to streamline your grading and it doesn't have to you can still provide that detailed feedback to students whether it's over here writing on the um, assignment and providing those in text um, comments or if i were to go back into the rubric one really nice feature that i am embarrassed that i recently discovered is see this little comment box like uh, icon if I click on that, I could provide specific comments to what that student did well on their, like, you know, you, you know, did a great job, you know, with your uh, thesis statement, you know, I could provide that directly there and they're going to see that in their um, uh, rubric when they go to View their results. So you see how it's not only that, they'll also get a comment from the instructor. Yeah, so Lillian says the comment box has become handy for feedback. Um, I love these rubrics because they make that grading process so much simpler. It's clicks, it's direct feedback right on what those criteria are. I can get a, I can go from student to student. Imagine if I had other students in this and I could kind of see as Jill was saying earlier, where students are falling if I pull out their the rubrics. Um, and I can also, if I want to write like a summative statement of like, this is how you did overall, right? I can still provide that feedback in here. Um, so those are some of the things that I really love about building these in, um, uh, in Canvas. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, no problem. And actually, I'm going to stop share, guys, and I'm going to drop in a quick little handout that I've used uh, that kind of walks through how to uh, create those just as we said. Oh, I wanted to show one other thing. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, 
this is another, I don't know if you know this, but for those of y'all, since we have so many people in here who have been uh, using rubrics, this is a fun feature. If you go down and you use peer reviews, students will actually get to see that rubric that you created and they can use the rubric to evaluate each other. So um, if this were an essay and I wanted my students to have an opportunity to provide peer feedback, I could create a rubric that I wanted them to use and I could give them instructions on how to use it. And that's a really great way of teaching students how to read rubrics themselves, right? Because then they're in the process of actually using one to evaluate each other. Um, I also find it really helpful because if you've ever assigned peer reviews, students sometimes don't always know how to provide peer feedback, right? <laughs> so it provides a little bit of structure where they can go in and, um, and use uh, the rubric to say, okay, this is what you did good regarding organization of your paper, et cetera. That's so a, that was just a- That's a good idea. Time. Yeah, I've seen that. I've never used it. I'm thinking like, I haven't, I haven't done this an online class, but, you know, I think, I think um, there may be a good opportunity there too for maybe a specialized rubric for when you have groups or group, mm -hmm. group projects. So students can, so that you can sort of create some kind of accountability with the workload and, and uh, make things equitable. A hundred percent. One of the things that I haven't tried it myself, but I've heard other faculty do is with a group project, having them come up with like a rubric for uh, like group participation. So that way they're actually coming up with the rubric of how they're going to like, what does a good group member look like, right? It's a person who responds to emails, you know, and does these different things. And that way you can use that as kind of to create a rubric for how they're going to score each other on how they did. So uh, that's a good idea. I haven't played with that. That would probably be another another level, another step. You know, the group project would probably need to be like a semester long project to have that really pay off. But uh, I could see there'd be some fun ways to have students uh, create a rubric for, for a group project. Good job. Thank you, Aaron. Um, oh. Goodness, rubrics on a Friday. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> So in this presentation, we've discussed um, a few different types of rubric types and their benefits. I'm thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Amanda, um, for chiming in on your experience with rubrics. We critiqued a rubric with regard to student success. We applied rubric results to enhance teaching methods and practices. And we took a little tour of a, demo, a demonstration from Aaron on how to create rubrics in Canvas. So thank you so much, Aaron, for that. Um, I on the slides I've provided some links to better serve you with some verbiage if you're needing to get some descriptor description uh, verbiage on your rubrics also to try to see how you can align your um, objectives I'm sorry your criteria to certain assessments or assignments that you could start using in um, uh, Canvas. Um, one of the pieces of information I forgot to put on this slide was there is, I'm gonna put it in the chat menu, um, where it goes over assessment and rubrics. It's called Cult of Pedagogy. I know it sounds a little weird, um, <laughs> but she has a podcast um, that deals with rubrics. Um, you could even just put that into um, a, a search field and um, she goes over the single, her, her, her big, um, I guess, intention with rubrics is the single point rubric so she has a a lot of different ways that she uses the single point rubric that might be useful to you yes i love the cult of pedagogy um so yeah so that is just one one of the other resources that might help you with creating a rubric um if you have any questions my email is here jgomez827 at alamo.edu on the slide um i don't know if you've already put it in there aaron but um, if you want to schedule a one on one consultation, I'm available and I'm here at the browsers hall. So please come and say hello to me. I'm so glad y'all made it today.